Hi, it's Wednesday, June 30th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Matthew's Gospel. And today it's Matthew 12, verses 38 to 42. And I'm just doing little bits of Matthew, because I think, I think I'm going to do a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, and a little bit Friday, which will get us basically uh, through the end of chapter 12 um, as the week concludes. Um, and and the reason I'm doing that is, one, I want to spend a little extra time uh, with Matthew, but I think each of these little bits is quite um, chewy, quite wonderful. There, there's, there's stuff in it, and I don't want to rush through it all. As you know, Jesus has been healing, um, but the Pharisees don't want to see that. Um, they're not, they've made their mind up about Jesus, so no matter what he does, he's breaking Sabbath rules, or more to the point, he's in league with, with, with demons. We, we just had that. Um, and then Jesus, but Jesus reminds him, like, good is good. Evil is evil. Good fruit comes from good trees. Evil, bad fruit comes from bad trees. Um, you know a good thing. You know a good person when you see one. And the fact that you don't want to see me, right, uh, means you're also denying the Holy Spirit, God's presence in the world. So say what you want about me, but don't deny God's presence in the world. Jesus is very big on that. And, 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 and what you say matters. It reveals what's in your heart. So Jesus is recognizing uh, that the Pharisees, um, for a variety of reasons, um, are denying what they suspect or know to be true. Um, Jesus is um, is God's presence. The kingdom of God is is evident um, in, in, in Jesus' presence and in what he's doing. Um, but that's sort of where we are, and we'll also have a little bit now and then a little bit tomorrow, but just a little bit now. So... Um, Matthew 12, 38 to 42. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the, of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will rise up at that judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah. And see, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment from this generation and condemn it, because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And see, something greater than Solomon is here. Stop right there. Um... So a couple of neat pieces, I think, in this. Um, the Queen of the South, who's the Queen, queen of she the queen, queen of Sheba. Uh, and if you read your Hebrew scriptures, Queen of Sheba did travel uh, to, 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 uh, to seek the wisdom and the company of, uh, of Solomon. Um, so Solomon, wise, uh, the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, Jesus is saying, yeah, even bigger than that. And trust me, the Pharisees would revere Sol Solomon. Um, and, and also then the sign of, of, of Jonah, um, and, and the Jonah story is so wonderful. I, I know and it would appear that Matthew is including this, um, because it, it, it so nicely points to, to the, the, uh, crucifixion to the resurrection moment, right? Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. So for three days and three nights, the son of man will be in the heart of the earth. Um, so we go, oh, there you go. See that there, there's the proof you need. Uh, Jonah was in a whale. Jesus is in the tomb. It's the same kind of thing. Okay. So on the face of it, Jesus could well know exactly what's going to happen to him. Um, and I don't have an issue with that. And lots of faithful, reasonable people, that's exactly what they believe. And that's how they read this. So Jesus knew what was going to happen and told them that. I got it. Uh, the other possibility is that Matthew has made this up, put these words in Jesus' mouth, so as to highlight the fact that that the uh, that the crucifixion, resurrection, the time of the tomb is intended. It wasn't an accident, and it indicates who Jesus is. Because remember, the people who are hearing these stories, or eventually reading these stories for the first time, they already know about the resurrection. Okay, um, so this just sort of you know uh, grounds the story in that, but also grounds. Um, the resurrection story in, 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 in the, the, uh, the full uh, length and breadth of Scripture. Got it. 
I think it's more likely in my mind, for me, what makes sense for me is that Jesus said this or something very close to this. Matthew remembers it and brings it into this story right now. And the reason I say that is because it's it's done imperfectly. Um, I don't want to be, you know, too tricky here, but just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. So for three days... And three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. But Jesus wasn't in the tomb for three days and three nights. Jesus went into the tomb on Friday night, was in there on Saturday, although we have a tradition that says he descended into hell, etc. But anyway, was in the tomb Saturday night, and the next morning was resurrected. There are three days involved, but not three nights in the tomb or in the belly. Not three days in the tomb or in as it, as was in the belly um, of Jonah of the whale with Jonah, and, and I just don't think that Matthew would make that mistake if he was trying to uh, manipulate us. Right? He could have remembered Jesus saying it was two days. I mean, he could have remembered that, right? But he doesn't. So he's he's, he's done it this way because I think he remembers Jesus saying this, um, and that. It does indicate um, a connection to to the resurrection, but it's not a proof of kind of thing, uh, and it's not a manipulation. It's like I remember. It. Let's get that. Yeah, let's remember. Let's put this in here. Um, I think that more important than than Jonah or or even Jesus in this situation, it's the people of Nineveh. Okay, and if you read this, the Jonah story, the people of Nineveh, uh, they were far gone. They were not going to listen. They, uh, they were large and powerful, very, very sure of themselves. Uh, and when you read the story, I mean, they are of epic size and proportion, mythological, can't even be real. Uh, I think it's very metaphorical, actually. But the thing is that, that, that everybody knows the story of this great and powerful um, city-state uh, of, of Nineveh. And they um, are out of relationship with God and don't care. And in fact, if you go through the story, Jonah doesn't want them to get right with God anyway. But God makes Jonah do it. And Jonah does. And they do, and boy, do they repent. They repent to a ridiculous degree. Everybody is in ashes and sackcloth. Uh, they, <laughs> they all fast. They make their animals fast. They dress their animals in sackcloth. I mean, it's just over the top it all changes and so jesus is telling a dramatic story about people who were so so wrong that to become right they had to really turn things over and go right on crazy over the top even them jesus is saying even them um they they repented at the proclamation of jonah and something greater than jonah is here me i'm bigger than i Jonah turned everything around here. I can turn everything around here if you're willing to turn. I have, it's all there for you. Um, so you, you you revere the wisdom of Solomon. I got more than that. The incredible story of Jonah. This is bigger than that. But of course, the Pharisees started this off with, "Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you," as if they haven't really been listening at all to what's been said in the past. Jesus has done these things and said. Good trees, good fruit. There's your sign. Um, and, and and they're not buying it. And so they're just, they're dithering. Um, they're not going to change their minds publicly. They're not going to change their hearts. They're just going to dig in harder. Yeah, well, then show us a sign. Okay, I just showed you 100 signs. Show us 101 signs is essentially what they're doing. And then Jesus has just had it and says, you know, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given it. No sign will be given it because they're not going to accept it. And you know what that's like, right? You, you know what it is um, to, to argue with somebody who simply will not listen. To try to convince somebody who has made up their mind and will not allow themselves to change their mind. There's no point. There is no sign for these people because there's no sign that they would ever accept. Right? If, if, if Moses and Elijah showed up and said, yeah, Jesus, he's the one. 
they go, oh, oh, yeah, there you go. Jesus obviously talked to talk, talk to Beelzebul, and, and, and that's how they've got someone who looks like Moses but isn't really. No matter what happens, they will not believe. So there's no point. There is no sign for them. And I've heard this preached a whole bunch of ways and talked about a whole bunch of ways, uh, and I'm not going to go down their path, but there's a neat thing here for me. Um, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. So Jesus might just be disparaging everybody. Going like, you know what? You people are evil, and, and let's just add a little bit of that kind of social evil. You're all adulterers. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, it's like just hurling personal invect invective at somebody and calling them whatever nasty, licentious name you can think of. Maybe it's that. But adultery is about... Um, it is about betraying or denying relationship. It's not about sex. It's about denying or betraying a relationship. So you're in a relationship with somebody. If you commit adultery, you have fractured that relationship and you are no longer in that relationship. You may claim to be, right? You may wear a wedding ring. You may appear in public together. Um, but that bond that you had has been broken. I'm not doing a marriage counseling thing here. I won't talk about how whether it can be repaired. Nothing to do with that. I'm just talking as Jesus says, an adulterous generation means this generation has, has broken the relationship. Uh, and it may appear to be fine, but it's not. Well, who's the relationship with? Well, the relationship is with humanity and God. Um, the Pharisees have a relationship with God. They wear it in their clothes. Um, and yet it's, yet they have betrayed it, I believe Jesus is saying. Uh, and the people here all may claim to be faithful, but they're not. Because if you're faithful, you don't need a sign. Because you feel it, right? You know. So when Jesus is doing good things... You're glad that Jesus is doing good things and you want to be part of that. You recognize God at work in the world. If you're in a relationship with God, you recognize God at work in the world. So you don't need someone to say, oh, by the way, this is God at work in the world. No, no, your, your relationship is such that, of course I recognize that. Same way as I recognize my wife's perfume when I walk into the house. Um, oh, yeah, that's Anne. I, I know that. I recognize her voice from far away. I can, I see her in the distance. I know who that is. We are in relationship. There's an intimacy um, that hasn't been broken. And so I recognize her presence. I recognize um, the shape of her, the sound of her, the smell of her. I know who she is. And I think what Jesus is saying is when you are in relationship with God, you don't need anybody to tell you there's proof, there's a sign. You are recognize it so this is an adulterous generation that's why you're asking for a sign because you're un you're incapable i don't have to ask and i don't want to keep going back into my relationship i don't have, but i don't have to keep asking my wife to prove to me that she loves me right we live in such a way that we know that about each other doesn't hurt to say it every now and again um but but, but we know that, and that's what I think Jesus is pointing to. This adulterous generation has fallen out of relationship with God. It looks fine, and they're claiming it is. But you don't recognize God's presence in the world. You don't recognize me, Jesus is saying. If you were really in good relationship with God, you'd recognize that I am from God, that I am no threat to you that I am trying to help you and to help others, that I'm trying to fill and fulfill the faith in the scriptures. I'm not trying to take anything away. But in falling out of relationship with God, you have become petty. You have become fearful. Um, and you have become uh, narcissistic. Everything is all about you. So when I think about that, when I wonder about that, I wonder about my own relationship with God. I wonder about my church's relationship with the community. I wonder about all sorts of things like that. And I ask myself, so have I become petty? Am I living fearfully? Has my faith only become about me? 
And when that's true, well, then perhaps it's because I am being adulterous, that I am somehow not living into my relationship with God, but I am betraying it. Now, the great thing about my relationship with God is I can always work at it. And I believe that God is always working at it with me, too. So it, it, it matters only uh, what matters is my my desire, my intention, my and then my ability to turn my heart to change and do better. I don't have to be held accountable for everything that I've done in the past if I am able to turn and change. Right? Eh, I know the accountable thing. I'm wondering about that too. But but the importance is that I move forward into my relationship with God. Even Nineveh did it. And they were massively horrible and out of, out of step with God. But Jonah, for God through Jonah, turned them around. So I can too. But I got to stop asking for signs. Um, it's been once, it's been said, um, it's been said by me, um, but in part of my learning in terms of um, spending time with couples and counseling, and, and I have spent some time with, you know, with, with people in relationship, uh, and they're trying to fix or work or, or enhance their relationship. And one of the things I'll say is, you know, as soon as you start keeping score, um, you're starting to lose. Well, I did these five things and you only did four. How come I always do this and you never do that? As soon as you start keeping score, well, basically what you're saying is I'm looking for signs. I recognize that in human relationships. And Jesus is saying the same thing. As soon as you're keeping score, as soon as you're asking for signs, you're losing the relationship. So focus back on the relationship. And I'll tell you, some days I feel like I'm in a pretty darn good relationship with God. Other days, well, I recognize I've been looking for a sign because I've gotten mean or angry or afraid. I've become a little bit petty and I've made it all about me. Hmm. I'm going to stop there and leave that with you. I think there's lots to wonder about here. I've told you what I'm wondering about in it, but there may be more. So don't, don't be afraid to disagree with me and please find something that I've gone over. Something that just speaks to you right now. Because that's what scripture is meant to do. It's meant to speak to you right now. Right? And, and, and I hear it more readily the more that I listen. <laughs> kind of like, you know, when you live in faith, you don't have to look for signs. The more that I do this, the more that I wonder, the more readily I hear God speaking to me in scripture. The more readily I see God active in the world around me. And that's the very thing that Jesus is inviting me to do. So... I invite you to do the same thing today. And for now, just let me offer a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for this time of wonder. Not that we're looking for signs, but that we are looking to deepen our faith, deepen our relationship with you. We are looking to open our heart, open our eyes, that we might see you in the world that we might recognize that our very lives are signs of your presence. God, we hope that today is a step forward in a healthier relationship, in a better relationship between us and you. We know that you are always moving toward us today. Let our wondering move us towards you. We pray through the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's enough of me for now, but uh, I guess what I want to say is God bless you. You are in relationship with God, uh, and God does love you, and God does act through you. Um, so know that you're not alone, and don't be afraid to love. We'll see you tomorrow.